The ancient Greeks said if you see more similarities and differences, you have infatuation. If you see more differences and similarities, you have resentment. If you see a balance of similarities and differences, you have love. In order to discuss relationships, in order to have a relationship, you have to relate between yourself and somebody else. So what exactly are these two people that are having this dynamic? And one thing I've learned in the last 50 years of my research is that human beings live moment by moment by a set of priorities, a set of values in their life that are unique, like fingerprints specific to them. And no two people have the same vantage point, same voids, and therefore same values that drive their life. And in this set of values or hierarchy of values that are unique to that individual, whatever is highest on the value list, they are spontaneously inspired to do. Their ontological identity revolves around it. So if you ask them who are they, they will say whatever is highest on their value. They have a high value on raising children. They'll call themselves a mother. They have a high value on raising a business or building a business. They'll call themselves an entrepreneur, for instance. Their teleological purpose is targeted in their highest value. And their epistemological area of knowledge is maximized in their highest value. So who they are, what they know, what is inspiring to them, what they spontaneously want to do is all revolving around that highest value. So when you're in a relationship with them, you have two people, each with higher values, each communicating, hopefully, in each other's values, or the relationship starts breaking down. Think of it as a customer. If you have a customer, they have a certain set of needs, values, and if you provide a product, service, or idea that matches those dominant buying values, dominant buying motives, the thing that they want the most, they're engaged and they participate, want to have a fair exchange with you. And they'll keep doing it as long as you keep providing something for them that's a fair exchange. Well, relationships are no different. Relationship with customers, relationship with employees, relationship with people, relationship with closest loved ones, spouses. Believe it or not, it's a consumer game. People are wanting to get something for something. You know, I've interviewed people in my, my signature program, The Breakthrough Experience, and I found that when you actually look at what men or women are looking for in relationship, they're looking for somebody that's, you know, fit, attractive. Um, they're looking for somebody that's intelligent. They're looking for somebody that's ambitious. They're looking for somebody that's got resources or at least as many resources as they do. They're looking for somebody that really wants to be with them, that really, you know, has affection for them. They're looking for somebody that's got social savvy and can connect with the people that are important to them in their lives. They are looking for somebody that's actually inspired by something and has some mission in life. And that's attractive. And I've asked thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people, about how many of you are looking for that, and they're all put their hands up. They're wanting to fulfill the seven areas of their life to the maximum. And they're trying to filter out of the options that they have in a relationship uh, to get the best package they can, to get the most advantage to fulfilling those areas as possible. So the more in line and congruent you are with what you value most, the more you empower those areas. And the more you ask how is mastering those areas helping you fulfill what's most meaningful, the more successful you are doing that or more achieving you are in those areas. And the more magnetic you are in attracting relationships and keeping them. And I've seen people that have been in relationships and when all of a sudden their fitness is going down, their, you know, their intelligence is dropping, their ambitions are dropping, their, their resources are dropping, their affection is dropping, their social connections are dropping, their, their inspiration is dropping. Sometimes the partner they're with is starting to lose inspiration to be with them. So we really have sort of a responsibility our whole life, particularly if we get in a long-term relationship, to keep empowered in those areas as much as possible, which is my job in educating, trying to give people the most advantage in those areas. It's one of the reasons I teach the Breakthrough Experience and other programs I do. Now, because we're in a relationship with someone and they're trying to fulfill what's most important to them in the seven areas of their life, and you're trying to do the same, you want the best bang for the buck. You want the best package you can get. 
and you want to constantly surround yourself with people that you believe give you the most advantage over disadvantage in any moment in time. So you're literally hanging out with people that are giving you advantages in each of those areas, and they are too, the person you're in relationship with. And if you don't provide that, they go somewhere else. <laughs> I say anything you're not willing to delegate, anything you're not willing to, you know, offer your mate, you got to be willing to delegate. Somebody else is going to provide it. Any area of your life you're not empowered in, people can overpower you. You know, I had a, a gentleman that was upset because a woman walked off with another guy. They were just dating, but she went off with another guy. And I said, what are you offering her? And when he really looked at it compared to the other guy, the guy was offering more in her eyes. And he wasn't really providing in the seven areas what she was looking for. And she has a right to go and select out of the thing the best package she can. I think all animals and you know are trying to get the best package they can. I was in Antarctica and I was looking at at the beautiful penguins and I was watching penguins, the female penguins were actually selecting the males and the males were trying to show off for the females and they were trying to get the best package. And whoever had the male penguins in the biggest pile of rocks, the hottest looking penguins were attracted to. <laughs> it's not much difference in humans. But <clears throat> in relationship, there are three things that I found that really help in um, increasing the probability of having a sustainable relationship, if that's what you're interested in. And I'm not going to say it has to be that way. I, I met my, I had grandparents that lived, you know, I think 80 years together. They died at 100 and 101, I believe. And they were in their 20, I think, when they first got together. And, you know, they had freaking 80 year marriage relationship. I thought that's amazing. But they had kind of an average life. It wasn't, wow, it wasn't super exciting. It was, and I don't think there was some sort of afterlife points that they were getting because they stayed together or whatever. It's, uh, they had obviously vows together. They were Italian tradition and they stayed together and that's how they were. But I've also met a, met a woman that was uh, 94 years old that had just climbed Mount Kilimanjaro, had been married five times. Each one she escalated her income off of. She did well. She said to me when she told me, she said, all my husbands died having sex with her. And I thought, well, that's an interesting one. I wasn't going to be interested in that topic. Uh, but, but in the process of doing it, I thought, well, here's a lady alive. She's got 30 years worth of gold. She's 94 years old and she's traveling the world. I said, well, here's a lady that's just as fulfilled as my grandparents were. So I don't want to put a box about how it's supposed to be. You know, there's all kinds of moral hypocrisies about how you are to be. And of course, around the world, there's no universal moralities around that. It changes through time and space and the predictabilities and profit, you know, the, the, the probabilities of each of these are different each, each decade and century. So I don't want to say that this is how it has to be. And if you're not that way, there's a, some flaw in you or that you've made a mistake or you're failing in a relationship. I find that just unproductive. The question is, is are you mastering the art of communicating what you want in terms of what other people want? Are you mastering the art of reflective awareness and seeing that what you see in them is inside you so you're less judgmental? People want to be loved and appreciative of who they are. And who they are is an expression of what they value most. And they're not wrong with what they value because that varies. And then you'll see a whole spectrum of people out there in the world with all the different value systems out there. So you're not right and they're not wrong and you're not wrong and they're not right. They're just different. And sometimes similarities with overlap and sometimes quite different. You know, if you think you're going to find somebody that's exactly like you, you'll have the twilight zone and you'll want to probably end their lives with a short period of time. You know, I always say that you're looking, you know, looking for a relationship. You're looking for somebody that's going to have both support and challenge. The ancient Greeks said if you see more similarities and differences, you have infatuation. If you see more differences and similarities, you have resentment. If you see a balance of similarities and differences, you have love. And I think that that's probably reality. No two people have the same set of values. No two people are going to see exactly eye to eye. And you're going to have things that you get along with and things that are supportive and other things that are challenging. Agreements and disagreements and slugs and hugs are parts of life. Or hugs and slugs are parts of life. So I think that that's uh, realistic. If you have a fantasy, you're supposed to get support without challenge or positive without negative or nice without mean or kind without cruel or generous without stingy or only one-sided, or you're expecting them to live only in your values and not their own, uh, or you're expecting you to be one-sided or you're to live in their values, not your own, that's another delusion that you'll probably face. But when you understand that you're there to communicate what you value in terms of what they're valuing, not making yours or theirs right or wrong, but appreciating how theirs serves you and you serve them, now you have the potential for having a 
sustainable relationship, just like if you were if you were having a customer. So there are three little steps, little action steps you can do that can assist you on the relationship. If you want a long-term relationship, if you want that, or if you don't, <laughs> I'm not attached. I'm not uh, saying it has to be that way. I think it's simpler that way. It has uh, less complexities, uh, but I'm not saying that's the way it has to be. I don't want to put a rigid moral construct on that and lock you into something and then think, well, somehow, you know, why am I, it's not happening for me and what's wrong with me and you know, all that stuff. I think that's ridiculous. But here's something that I do believe that will help. On my website, drdmartin.com, there is a complimentary um, simple private value determination process. I would encourage you to go through that and ask, it's, it's asked you 13 questions. I would encourage you to go through that and ask yourself that and do it again today and do it a week from now and do it a month from now and do it three months from now and every three months, do it again and keep the ones you have and document what it is that you have on there. The first time you do the exercise, you'll have to resist the, 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 the tendency to want to lie to yourself. You're going to want to say, you know, what your values are, what you think they are, instead of what they actually are. Your life demonstrates what you value. And it's wise to actually let your honor, be honest about what your answers are on these questions. These questions are 13 questions that are value determinants. They give a more objective view. And you, if you answer them as instructed, you'll get a really amazing summary of what's important to you and what you're really committed to and what you're purpose is and what your identity is and what you're most skilled at, which is very valuable in life because you want to be loved for that. And knowing what that is, is a first step. If you don't even know what's important to you, uh, you'll be clouded in what your needs are and it'll be hard to communicate that effectively to somebody else. But take the time to go to the value determination process on my website, drdmartin.com. Determine your values, look that up and do that and do it again a week, do it a month, do it every three months. And keep records of them and look at the evolution of what you've written and look at how you've been integral in the answers until you can see that your life is really committed to that. You know, my highest value is teaching. I do it every friggin' day. I've been doing it 50 years and I'm inspired to do that. I love doing that. It's something I do every single day. I can't wait to get up in the morning and do that. But everybody has something different. And some people are dedicated to business and some to learning and some to spirituality, whatever that's meanings to them. Some to to their uh, family and their children, and you're not right or wrong for whatever that is. And if you think you're right and you project that onto other people, you're going to end up getting resistance or you're going to end up having in-group, out-group biases, which is going to hinder relationship dynamics. But if you first identify what your values are and don't perceive them as good or bad or right or wrong or the way it should be or ought to be or supposed to be or got to be or have to be or must or need to be, just identify what they are. They are what they are. And don't judge it relative to somebody else. Just identify what it is objectively. That's the first step. I think that's a very powerful key because that way you get to know you. You, need to, you want to be loved for who you are? Well, that's going to be who you are. What's top of those values? The second aspect of that first step is whoever you're in relationship with, whoever your closest you know, compadres are in your inner circle of people, your spouse, your children, your colleagues that are key colleagues, closest family, extended family members or whatever, I would take the time to inspire them and encourage them to do the same. And just tell them that, you know, I would like to have a greater relationship with you. And I found there's a tool that can help us respect each other and have dialogue instead of alternating monologues where I'm speaking, you're not listening, you're speaking, I'm not listening, but a dialogue. By taking the time to go through the value determination process, it takes 30 minutes of your time. And that way I know what you're up to. And I can see, as a result of that, how to more effectively communicate in terms of what you value and respect it. So taking the time to do that and do that methodically, chronologically, or one, one at a time, prioritization of who it is most important down to less, less most important, etc. And go through and do the value determination. That's step number one. Step number two is one by one, whoever those key inner circle people are, spouse starting identify this question. How specifically is what they're dedicated to, their top three highest values, how specifically is it helping you fulfill what you're dedicated to, your top three highest values? And how specifically what you're dedicated to, your top three values, helping them fulfill what they're dedicated to, 
their top three values. In other words, whatever their identity revolves around, how is it helping you fulfill what your identity revolves around? If you answer that question, just know the more you answer that question until you get a tear of gratitude in your eyes for who they are and how they serve you, the more you do that, I guarantee you, the more respect and the more love, the more effective communication you will have between you and your, this individual. See, when you feel you're communicating with them and you're helping them get what they want, you're helping you get what you want, and there's a nice, sustainable, fair exchange and relationship, then this thing lasts. And you feel inspired to be with them. You want to be around them. And you're both helping each other fulfill what you feel is your missions in life. And that's very empowering. But if you are righteously think their values are wrong, you're going to project your values on them carelessly and try to get them to live in your values, which is futile. Or if you're minimizing yourself and infatuate with them and you're injecting their values and trying to live in their values, you're going to try to live in values you can't live in. That'll be futile. Both of those are frustrating and futile. And the normal dialogue then goes into gestural communication and a frustration and eventually aggression because you don't know how to communicate effectively. You're not getting what you want from them. And then the breakdown occurs. But by asking the question, because the quality of your life is based on the quality of the questions asked, if you ask questions and how specific what they value help you fulfill what you value and vice versa, and don't stop until you get enough answers. I, I've had it where I put down a hundred answers between those two top two people's top three values. The top three values that you determine from the value determination, whatever those are, how specifically are those top three values helping you fulfill your top three value? Your top one to the top one, the top one, the second one, the second one to the top one, the second to the second, the second to the third, the third, the third. Just go through and link them all. The more links you have, the more you're going to see that whatever they're dedicated is helping you fulfill what you want in life. And you're going to want to be around them. And you're going to love and appreciate them. And love and appreciation is where it's at. And one of the things I teach in the Breakthrough Experience is this method. How to determine your values, how to link values, how to apply the linking of things you dislike in them and how to see how they serve you and the things that you're infatuated with and how and bring them back down, see the downsides of that so you can basically bring yourself into a balanced state with them. I teach you how to do that in the Breakthrough Experience. That's why I want people to come to Breakthrough because the enormous impact in their life on just relationships alone, let alone the other areas of their life, is enhanced by knowing that knowledge. It's very unique knowledge. It's not taught anywhere else that way. And so taking the time to link the values of the people you care about is step number two. That is a gold mine when it comes to relationship. Step number three, and this is what I call the Demartini Method. The Demartini Method is this very, very important series of questions to ask yourself to have reflective awareness, to be able to see the hidden order and the apparent chaos and the dynamics of any relationship, and allows you to realize that whatever you judge in them, you've got in you. When you point your finger out, you got three back. Because many times we self-righteously think that they've done something that's betraying us or something. Nobody really betrays us. We betray ourselves by expecting them to live in our values, not their own. And then we have this fantasy that we hold on to, and this unrealistic expectation that they're supposed to be nice, never mean, kind, never cruel. We're supposed to live in our values. We're supposed to read their minds. We're supposed to live in this fantasy social value system that we've been indoctrinated by. But the real truth is they live according to their own values. The only thing they're really committed and to fulfill is that. And that's not narcissistic. That's not immature. That's human behavior. They've been labeling that in some psychology circles, but that's not the fact. The fact is that human beings are dedicated to the fulfillment of what their values are and, they, and are, their fitness is maximum when they have a balance of support and challenge in the pursuit of that. So if you ask the question in the Demartini Method, what specific trait, action or inaction, do I perceive this individual that I'm in a relationship with displaying or demonstrating that I admire most and I despise most? Why? Because if you admire them and put them on a pedestal and minimize yourself, you're going to be sacrificing altruistic to be in a relationship and build up gradually resentment until you get things back into balance. And if you resent somebody and you project their values onto them, you're going to alienate them until they get resentful, until they end up going in distant, and then you get humbled and put back in balance. But the moment you actually find out what it is that you infatuate and resent, and then go and ask the next question, go to a moment, John, yourself, uh, where and when do you display that same specific trait action in, in action that you perceive in them? 
that you admired and despised them. Go find out where you've done that. The moment you reflect and introspect and discover that whatever you resented about them is something that's reminding you of something you feel ashamed about in your past, and they're reminding it to you, and that's why you're avoiding them, wanting to avoid them, because they're reminding you of what you're not loving in you. And they're actually an opportunity to teach you that and to grow in your own life by being in that relationship with them so you can be more authentic and appreciate the part you're denying and, de and negating. And the same thing when you admire somebody, it's because it's reminding you of something you have, but you're too humble to admit you have, that you admire in yourself. And then being around them is fun because it's reminding you of what you like about yourself, your addiction to your own pride. But if you actually go in there and identify where you've done all the things you see in them and level the playing field and realize that the seer, the seeing, and the seeing are the same, your relationship communication goes skyrocketing. Because now you realize, who am I to judge them? And you respect them. You can't respect somebody when you're judging, looking down or up. You can put them on pedestals, you can put them in pits, but you won't put them in your heart until you balance that equation. So in the breakthrough experience, I teach you the Demartini method on how to identify what you're judging in them, which blocks the communication, and how to level the playing field and see that what you see in them is inside you. So you can reflect. When you have true intimacy is when you own everything you see in them. If you're denying, if too proud or too humble to admit what you see in them inside you, there's no intimacy. You've got a block. You've got disowned parts and you're looking down or up at them instead of looking across at them heart to heart and eyes to eye. The windows of the soul can't occur because you're not going to trust them when you have these infatuation and, and resentments or trust yourself. Now, when, all, when, you, when you're looking down at the individual, you're thinking there's better options out there. When you're looking up, you don't want them to be with better options. You want you're more jealous. So you, when you level the playing field, you have a bantering, a respectful banter that goes on where you can keep each other in check. See, when you're looking down and, and, and resentful to them, you're afraid to say too many nice things because you don't want to mislead them because you're thinking of options. When you're in fact with them, you don't want to say things negative to them because you don't want them to have options and leave you. So you can't be authentic unless you have that level playing field. So that's why in the breakthrough experience, I spend a whole afternoon and evening showing people how to master the communication and how to master loving somebody and having intimacy. It's a gold mine when you learn that and you experience it and you have tears of gratitude for the individual for reflection. Then I go in there and I ask the question, all right, John, go to a moment where and when you perceive this individual that you're infatuated or resentful about uh, go to a moment when you perceive them doing these behaviors that you infatuate or resent. And now at that moment, when they're doing the trait you admire, what's the downside? And the trait you despise, what's the upside? Because every trait is neutral until somebody with a subjective bias and wounds of the past project what they perceive onto people. The real truth is if any of those behaviors weren't valuable in the, in the evolution of human beings, it would have gone extinct. But all those behaviors are there. They serve a purpose. And if you're seeing them uh, negative, you're not seeing the upsides. If you're seeing them positive, you're not seeing the downsides. There's two sides to it. So I hold you accountable by doing the Demartini method to balance that equation. Once you do, you realize that whatever they've done is neither positive nor negative. It's just an event. And now the question is, is you've done that event. How has it served when, you, when they've done it to you? How is what they're doing serving you? Because they're living according to their values, making decisions according to their values. If you can't appreciate what they're doing according to their values, you're not going to be able to love them. You're going to be trying to fix them and hold on to a fantasy of who they're supposed to be and try to get them to be that and punish them if they don't do that. But if you go and do that exercise, you level the playing field, you get to appreciate them for who they are, which is what they want. And when you turn when you appreciate them for who they are, they kind of turn into who you love. The, the next question is... <clears throat> Go to a moment where you've displayed those traits and whoever you've displayed those traits to find out how it's a drawback to them if you're proud of the trait or if you're ashamed of the trait, how is it a benefit to them? And clear out the pride and shame which is underlying the projected judgment you have on people. Once you do that, man, you just liberate yourself, lighten yourself up, have now self-governance, live from the executive function in the forebrain instead of the amygdala and emotionally reacting where you're living in a subjective bias of avoiding pain and seeking pleasure with unrealistic expectations on your relationship. And you get to now go on a path of love with somebody. Now, if you go one step further and ask the question, whatever I perceive in them, where do they do the opposite? So you break the labels that you put on people. I've, I've seen sometimes when people going through the divorce, their lawyers and their psychologists is, is misleading them into thinking, oh, that's a narcissist. 
so common. You're married to them for 20 years, all of a sudden they're a narcissist, even though you've been with them for 20 years. No, anytime you challenge somebody, they tend to get puffed up and they tend defensive with the sympathetic nervous system. They tend to get what they want to get what they want and put demands on you. They look more narcissistic. That's not who they are as a whole human being. That's just a moment while you're interacting with them and challenging their values. If you support their values, they become altruistic and sacrifice for you. Challenge their values, they become narcissistic and want to challenge, sacrifice you for them. But if you actually love them and level the playing field, th those labels go away. So the next question is, is asking, where do they do the opposite behavior to break the assumption that these labels are true? Because if you label people and box things up, you're going to compare them to other people with those labels and you're going to have your wounds or your fantasies, your phobias, your failures run your relationship instead of your love. And the next question is, uh, go to a moment where and when you perceive this individual displaying the trait, action or inaction that you admire or despise. And in that moment, identify where it was and when it was and what's the content and the context and who they're doing it to, you in most cases. And then find out who's balancing it. Because every perception you have is always a pair of opposites. They're contrast. You can't go into a room that's pure white and see anything. It has to have black and white contrast to see. If you had perfect sounds on both sides, the same distance, the same decibels, you, you'd have viral fusion. You wouldn't be able to hear anything and know where things are located. So you have to have a contrast to proceed. So at the moment of perception, the contrast is there. And in this question, it forces you to wake up and become conscious of what you're unconscious of to see the opposite that was there. Because you don't get one-sided events. You think you do. You mislabel your events in life as traumatic or ecstatic because of it. But in fact, there's nothing but really a pair of opposites synchronously, simultaneously, you know, a synthesis of these opposites, which is actually experience of love. When you actually ask the questions in the Martini method and bring it back to love, you have tears of gratitude for them for participating in a matrix of opportunity of love for you. Now, if you go to the last question and go, at the very moment you did the behavior that I admired or despised, if at that moment they had done exactly the opposite behavior, the thing they admired, if they had, let's say, generous, if they'd been stingy, what would have been the benefit to you? Because if you don't crack the nightmare that you're comparing them to, you'll be running off and having an addiction to a fantasy about them. And if you go the moment they did something you resented, at that moment, if they had done the opposite, it would have been the drawback to you and crack the night, the fantasy that you had about them. As long as you have a fantasy or a nightmare about them, you're going to keep projecting false past wounds and experiences and fantasies onto them, which undermines the relationship. So in the breakthrough experience, when I teach people the breakthrough experience and I make them go through each of these steps and experience it live and have them have a tear of gratitude at each one of these steps, they have a revelation about, wow, I asked people beforehand, you had the story and a, and a, a myth about who this individual was. When you're done, all you have is appreciation and love for them and yourself. You cannot do this exercise, this third step, without having deep love and appreciation for yourself and for the individuals that you're doing the method on. I, I dare anybody to finish the method, the Demartini method, and have anything other than tears of gratitude, love, and appreciation. If you finish that and get that, you will realize that no matter what you've been through, no matter what anybody's done, there's a way of loving it. Nothing you've been in, experiencing in your mortal body can, cannot be loved by your mortal soul, as he was saying. So I believe that those three steps are gold. And I, I, I took an extra few minutes today to go over those because I want you to know that that's available to you. That's why I tell people every week when I do this webinar to go and come to the Breakthrough Experience. They probably think I'm just selling another seminar. Well, sure, that's true too. But I can't help people unless I'm with them. I can do the presentation, but it's not the same as actually being there live and doing it and experiencing it. You can intellectualize it or you can experience it. That's why it's called the Breakthrough Experience. I want people to actually get the method. I want them to learn how to know how to do their values. I want to know them how to communicate in values and how to link values and then how to apply the values in the Demartini method so you can maximize your awareness and potential in your relationship so you can have dialogue, not mo alternating monologues, and have an intimacy and have a sustainable fair exchange in your relationship. So I am certain those three tools are helpful in relationship dynamics. I've taken thousands of people in the breakthrough experience, hundreds of thousands of people that have resented people deeply or infatuated people, the villains of the heroes they have in their life, and shown them how to dissolve that, all those labels, and allow them to have tears of gratitude for those people in their life. 
and look in the mirror and realize that that's now the more love for themselves. I ask people, how many of you feel more love for this individual and love for themselves? Every hand goes up. So if you'd like to have more authenticity, you'd like to have your executive function run instead of your amygdala's emotional center where you're judging things and, you know, out of governance, and you'd love to have more awareness of who they are and who you are and be able to have communication with respect and more intimacy and more love. And you want to be able to dissolve all the baggage you've accumulated on the past in your relationship. I can guarantee you can come to the program and I can show you how to do that. And the more you put into it, the more you're going to get out of it. But if you come and do that and are willing to come to work, it's not just a spectator game. It's an actual work where you get to see and feel and experience what I'm talking about. If you'd like to do that, bring that back to your relationship, to the close people in your life, at work, home, colleagues, customers, loved ones, spouses. If you'd like to take that relationship to the next level, then come to the break to experience. And come and listen to this, what I just gave you again and again and again. But come to the break to experience because I'm going to give you 24 hours, 26 hours of my heart and soul there working with you. And I can't wait to do that because I watched lives change and I love doing that. Do it every weekend almost. And if you do that, I assure you, you're going to be, at the end of the break, I ask people, how many of you have learned something this weekend? You have no way you would have learned anywhere else on this planet in your life. Every hand goes up. So if you want to go and learn something really cutting edge, it's really amazing and it works. It's a science. You can, if you follow it to the letter, you'll get an exact response and have more love and appreciation from people that you've got some buried burden sitting in there and some baggage on there. Let's let go of the baggage and drop it off the baggage claim department and let's get on with sailing and taking off on the plane, if you will, and take your relationship to the next level. So I just wanted to share with that. I ran a few minutes over this time, but that was a pretty pertinent topic, I think, because everybody's in relationship with somebody and uh, including themselves. And by the way, you can do the Demartini method on yourself so you can love yourself for all the baggage you've got, too. So either way, come to the break to experience and I'll show you how to do that. I'll show you how to apply these three principles. And um, I am absolutely certain it'll change the trajectory of your life and make a difference from now on in your relationships. So come and join me at the Breakthrough Experience. Thank you for joining me on this, this uh, little webinar. And I look forward to seeing you next week. Have a fantastic evening and look forward to seeing you very soon.